the opportunity to be with you today. Um, okay, so can I go over here? Um, that's all right, don't worry. That's better. Um, so this is the first in a series called The Throne of God. And honestly, in all my years, I've, I don't think I've come across quite such a, an, a, a really uplifting and exciting thing. Mm. And uh, we're just going to focus on where is the throne of God today. But every uh, session that we teach and we engage with, we want to be looking at how to not only build ourselves up, but to exhort or encourage us to action uh, but also to offer comfort and hope for today and for the future. Amen. So that's why we've got and what it means for us, you know, yesterday, today and the future. It's incredibly relevant. So, session number one. Where is God's throne? Now, I'd like you to look up Matthew. Um, just if you're a quick speedster in your Bible, uh, but if not, it's it's also written up there. If you've got a cell phone with the Bible app, it's quite quick and easy to do. But um, in the Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is actually teaching about this topic, and he says, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. What an incredible uh, thought to kick off this idea of God's throne. We don't really have a pico of an understanding of the extensive uh, dimensions of outer space, of the heaven of what we call the heavens, but it's big, it's enormous. And you think of what Jesus is saying here when he says, heaven is likened to God's throne. Mm -hmm. To me, that evokes an, an amazingly awesome respect for the, the almightiness of the God that we've come to know through faith in his son, the Lord Jesus, Yeshua. And he, he uses this metaphor of a footstool. You know, um, I don't know, sometimes you have a little foot pedal. A foot pedal's not quite a footstool, but it's, you know, you have a little stool sometimes to put your feet up on. Well, a king on a, a, a monarch on a throne would have sometimes this footstool to put his feet up on to make it nice and comfortable. Um, this passage likens the enormity of our earth just to God's footstool. It's humbling, it's yeah. sobering, but it, from a faith perspective, having been brought into God's family, it's incredibly encouraging and inspiring mm. because um, God's big. He's he's powerful. He's and there's lots of other euphemisms and things that we could use to describe it. So that's the first little thought that I I wanted to share with us. But having said that, we need to contrast God on His throne as God is also described as. Because he's on a throne, he is, as it were, a king. He's a, he's a ruler. But unlike human kings, God is totally unlimited. He's not limited by time. He's eternal. Um, his existence, uh, the fancy word there, it, it transcends. It, it reaches way beyond our mortal sphere that we are bound by. He's beyond time. He's certainly beyond earth. Pretty cool. 
Now, it's, it's also good to anchor these ideas in Scripture and see them from different perspectives, which relates to, um, you know, a couple of questions around Psalm 11 from Jeremy, and uh, uh, Rich has raised a couple of, or well, a question around Psalm, uh, Proverbs 25. But if we go to, um, just before we get there, this little, little gif, um, illustrates the day-night cycle. You imagine the Earth spinning around, and you can see uh, typhoons in the uh, northern hemisphere, sort of the northern Pacific. There, um, you've got Aussie down here. You just think of the enormity of our Earth. Um, you think how, in the past, kings have had a, a kingdom. They might have had just a tiny little bit of China or a tiny bit of Mongolia or a tiny little bit of England. And then they come and go like the days and the nights and they're gone. The pharaohs of Egypt, you know, you think of their rules and, and, and their thrones and how much power they had. But they come and gone mm. like the days and the nights. The spinning of the earth. But God transcends that. He's eternal. He's almighty. He doesn't come and go off the throne. Mm -hmm. Getting back to the previous one, I'd like us, if you're a speedster, to look at Isaiah 66. And, uh, because this is quite helpful when you engage with such a theme to recognize that um, the biblical narrative is, is really trying to reinforce some truths here. So if we go to um, Isaiah 66 and verse 1 and 2, would somebody like to read that either off the screen, which isn't all that clear, um, but maybe from the Bible. Thus right? says the Lord, heaven is my throne, or heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will put, uh, that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all these things, those things, my hand has made. And all those things exist, says the Lord. But one, but on this one will I look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. Thanks, Jeremy. What's special about that is that it, it shows you that Jesus is actually quoting from the scriptures that were known to the Hebrew people at the time. And this is embedded within Isaiah's prophecy. Uh, but it also reinforces the idea that though God has his throne in the heavens and earth is his footstool, he is interested, intimately <coughs> interested in individuals who live here, there, there and there in this vast thing that is vast for us, this earth, mm -hmm. if they are of a poor and contrite spirit and one that trembles at his word. And you know, everyone who comes to salvation has to go through that pathway mm -hmm. of uh, recognizing they are powerless, impoverished spiritually mm -hmm. to save themselves. Mm -hmm. We have to come to that point where we say, man, I've got nothing to offer God. No good works is going to work. I've got no money to buy my way into heaven. Um, <coughs> and the contrite heart, contrite means to express contrition and, and, and sorrow. It links to the idea of repentance. And we have to come to that state of contrition recognizing with sorrow and regret our muck-ups, our stuff-ups, our you name it, ups and downs, <laughs> and that only God, through His Son, the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, HaMashiach, can um, reconcile us to this amazing God whose throne is in heaven. And we, we find out about that through His Word. You know, it talks about um, 
faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Mm -hmm. So that's the power of the Word of God. It's, it's incredible. Through the Word comes the Gospel and that impacts us to recognize these things and to respond accordingly. <coughs> well, someone might say to us, You say God's throne is in heaven. Well, I haven't seen it yet. It's all very well to say God's throne is in heaven. But the space station hasn't photographed it yet. Mm -hmm. Hubble telescope hasn't zoomed in on it yet and sent through Google a photo of it. So people might say to you, well... It's all very well if you just say that, but where is it? You know, nobody's seen it yet. If it's that big, surely we would have seen it. <laughs> it's too big to see. Well, let's just reflect on that rhetoric, that sort of response. How do we engage with that? Because it's a fair response. <laughs> you know, we don't want to ridicule it. So here we go. Here's some arguments around that. I want you to think of the space station as we do this. So Hubble Telescope hasn't located God's throne and the International Space Station hasn't bumped into it. True. But through the revelation of Scripture, we believe He and the throne exist. Now, is that a rational conclusion? Is it rational to, to believe something in God's Word that both Yeshua and Isaiah have told us about? Mm -hmm. Well, let's put it to the test. The Hubble telescope, okay, didn't get there by a big bang in billions of years of blind, brainless chance, did it? Mm -hmm. I mean, this Hubble telescope has been repaired and, and fine-tuned to allow better telescopic mm -hmm. views of not only our solar system, but galaxies and other uh, sort of uh, phenomena in outer space. It was made by intelligence. Now this space station, with all its unfolding solar panels and its little habitable spaces, its computer gizmos and digital systems to maintain environmental control, the space rocket to get it up there, let alone to get the guys back, you know, did, that, did those things evolve by blind, brainless chance over billions of years? Even one of those little solar panels did one of them just get there by chance? As it was fizzing around the orbiting the Earth, did one just suddenly sort of bump into it and lock into space and provide energy for the people on board the space no. station? Absolutely, <laughs> categorically, <laughs> mathematically, <laughs> it's impossible. It's not probable, it's not possible, it's impossible. Mm. So people who poo-poo the idea that God is on the throne, and God exists, they know that a space station could not get here by the principles of cosmological materialism, the very things that evolutionary thinking is built upon. So let's compare now this space station with living things on Earth, things that we can go out and see just outside David and Angela's window, or out the door, or down at the beach. Let's compare the sophistication of the space station to things that exist that we can see. In other words, empirical evidence before our eyes. Well, the space station was engineered with special internal and external complex structures and mechanisms digitally programmed to maintain its orbit in a life-sustaining way around the Earth. Let's compare it now. Let's just think about it. There it is, one of those little satellite things buzzing around the Earth. Pretty sophisticated, but we know it couldn't get there by chance. Let's compare that with things to do with the Earth. So here we go. 
So which is more complex, guys? That little space station or the thing that's in the background of the space station? Just reflect hmm. on that. There's two or three people, maybe five or six, living on the space station. How many billions are living on the thing in the background? Hmm. Do you know what the Earth's population at the moment is? 7.9? Yeah, it's, it's getting close to 8 billion people. Well, 8 billion compared with maybe 8, 7 or 8 on a place that's a place station, <laughs> a space station. Let's just think about mm. how much sophistication is needed to run the Earth. You know, it's spinning on its axis. It's doing this orbit thing around the sun, 365 and about a quarter days every year. But the Earth is moving three-dimensionally through space with the other planets and the sun through the Milky Way galaxy at a phenomenal speed, which I'll show you at, at the very end of this presentation. Which is more sophisticated, guys? Eight billion people or eight people on a little space station? A little space station which just buzzes around in orbit or the whole of this planet Earth doing its thing around the sun? The, the one in the background. <laughs> <laughs> and look, I learned this week too that when you're in a space station, you can't even talk to the person next to you. That there's not even the mechanisms for the for your sound to, travel. to get travel to the next person. And I go, yeah. wow. Because there's no air, you see. Hang hey, on, that can't be quite right. No if they're inside the same compartment, they'll be able to talk because they've got something to breathe. Uh, there's a medium for sound yes. to travel. But when they're, in, when they're outside the space oh, okay. capsule, oh, there's right. no atmosphere, yeah, yeah. sound right. can't okay. travel. Yeah, sure. right. So why in the sci-fi movie, sound... But if they had sound, their um, uh, helmets on <laughs> and they had their you know, life support, oxygen supply and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, they wouldn't be able to communicate if they took their lids off and started talking to one another because mm -hmm. sound can't travel without any atmosphere. So, have you ever seen atoms? Have you ever seen an atom? Have you ever seen a proton, a neutron, an electron? Put your hand up, please. I've seen lots of them at once. <laughs> <laughs> have you honestly it's seen on the one? screen? Yeah. No, but have you ever seen it? Oh, no. 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 But you believe they exist, don't you? Yes. Have you ever seen a neutrino or a lepton or a quark or a you know, <laughs> these, these subatomic particles which they believe, you know, go in their millions to make up a single proton, an electron. Nobody's seen those, but they believe they exist. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to do is rationally argue that believing in an invisible God or someone that you can't see is not irrational, so long as it's backed up by evidence. Nobody has seen the little subatomic particle, and sub means below, atomic is tiny, particle that they believe originally expanded at superluminal speeds and created all the universe and all life. That's called the Big Bang Theory. A subluminal super, super, faster than the speed of life, expanding, and it just by chance produced everything that has now become into existence. Nobody's seen that, <coughs> but the people who will doubt that God is on the throne will believe that. So what I'm trying to argue mm. is that they have a faith position, just like we do, but which is more rational, to believe in a cosmic, undirected, blind, brainless chance event called the Big Bang, or an intelligent, wise, all-powerful creator. When we look at a space station, it doesn't support Big Bang Theory. It supports intelligent design. Mm. So when you look in the background, you go, it must have been intelligently designed. So that's what I believe. 
I believe in an all-powerful supernatural creator and um, called Yahuwah or Yahweh um, Elohim. So it's incredible. It's not silly to believe that there is a throne that God sits on. It's not silly to believe that God is on that throne. Even if you take the solar panels here, by the way, on this space station, did you know that they pale away into insignificance compared with chlorophyll that harnesses the solar energy in every leaf on David and Angela's plum tree and all the other plants you can see out the window. They do it better in a more sophisticated and sustainable way mm. than we can make with solar panels. Mm. Okay. So, having mm. said that, your neighbour or your person you're having a chat to may not be convinced. So let's just think about flexible wing design of migratory birds. I mean, this thing looks like wings and it's, it's flying around the earth every so many hours. It's pretty flash as a flying machine. Let's compare it with, say, a godwit. One of the most astounding birds that can migrate from way up in Siberia all the way down to New Zealand. They don't have GPS systems. They don't have a pilot or a navigator or air hostesses to bring coffee. They don't even call in at an airport to get refueled. And they know exactly where to go night and day till they reach the destination where they were basically born mm -hmm. with incredible accuracy. Mm -hmm. They travel further and better than modern aircraft. Modern aircraft cannot travel the distance of a Godwit without having to call in at an airport and get refueled. Modern aircraft cannot demonstrate the things that these Godwits do. Godwits can land on the sea because they've got flexible wings. Whereas modern aircraft are fixed wing aircraft. And by the way, the evolutionists would believe that this just happened by chance from an egg. Have you ever seen an aeroplane lay an egg on the runway? Have you ever seen an airport give birth to other planes? No. 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 <laughs> Do you know that we, the, the birds can molt their feathers and repair their feathers through the annual cycles. Have you ever seen a plane on the runway just getting better by its sitting there? No. Mm -hmm. Has to go into the workshop and get repaired. You see, these things are more sophisticated than man-made aircraft. So who made the bird? I believe it was God on the throne. But what about these little critters? These little delightful things that you love to hold and uh, <laughs> to have, <laughs> have feeding away at, in your bedroom. Spiders, do you know that technologists are trying to copy the sophistication of the production of silk in the, in the spinnerets and in the glands of the spider's abdomen? The spider's silk is so flexible and yet so strong, they're trying to replicate it for new materials on Earth today. You ever seen a spider's web? You know, it's, it moves in the wind and a fly whacks into it and it can kind of give and take. That's incredible. And they can adjust the thickness of the, the thread to go from a tree branch to a tree branch because it needs to be stronger. And that little critter never went to engineering school at Auckland University and got a BA and a, a Bachelor in Engineering. <laughs> what about these little fellas? Who manufactured this chubby little butterfly could just morph into a little chrysalis and come out so superbly designed and yet so different to what it was as a chubby little butterfly, a, a caterpillar? Caterpillars don't have wings. Sorry. You heard it right. Yeah. Caterpillars don't have wings. They don't have antennae. They don't have the head, abdomen, and thorax. They don't have reproductive capacity. 
they, they don't do hardly anything compared with a butterfly. Mm -hmm. When it goes into the chrysalis, it dies. It actually dissolves lots of its organelles. And when it comes out, every little tiny cell or little um, thing that makes up the patterns on those wings has to be in place. It's like getting thousands of spectators at a, uh, a, a big sports event all sitting in the right place. And when you say, open chrysalis, they all have to hold up the sign and, it, and they've all been given a, a picture and it all makes the beautiful patterns on the wings of the butterfly. By chance, that's nuts. God on the throne has, as we know from Romans, declared that the invisible things of him are clearly seen by the things that are made, mm -hmm. even as eternal power and Godhead. So when we're talking to people about God on the throne, we can rationally argue the case that though invisible, he does exist, and he is on the throne. I mean, just look at these little dudes. They're incredible. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but it gets even better. Imagine thinking about Earth, planet Earth. There's lots of planets in our solar system, but only Earth is in that Goldilocks zone where we can have, where it's it supports habitable life. If we're any closer to the sun, we would fry. If we're any further away from the sun, we would freeze. It's like Goldilocks, the porridge is too hot, yeah. or too cold, the Goldilocks was just... <laughs> and yet, even the location of our solar system within the Milky Way galaxy is in the Goldilocks zone. If our solar system was too close to the centre, we wouldn't be able to see the beautiful stars at night. It would just be a blaze of light because we've been so exposed to so many stars. And on it goes. It's incredible when you think of the location of planet Earth. You think of how regular and reliable our water cycle are, is. Mm. The seasons, the summers, the winters, the tides come and go. Everything's coordinated and organized. You go for a walk down the mount, you can see the tide goes out, comes in. It's incredible things. God is on the throne, although he's invisible. What about these characters? They communicate by sonar. Now, we have learned to replicate sonar for submarines and other submersible devices that can putter around in the ocean. But we don't do it as sophisticated and as efficiently as those fellas. They do it on the move, it's three-dimensional, they get the image back, the, the sound wave back from the object. <coughs> they have special organs which can process that information, distance, speed, size, whether it's alive or dead, so quickly in amongst all the other sound waves that other dolphins would be making and know exactly where to go and, <laughs> and grab that fish in the nick of time. They're incredibly sophisticated sonar systems. We had a student ask the question this week, why do, do, do humans use 10% of their brains or less yeah. and dolphins 20%? I don't know whether is correct in that, but I, I have to address it. Would you like to address it or just move on? I think it's a juicy conversation question, yeah. <laughs> um, the point I'm trying to get at, though, is that when you look at these things, they are aquadynamic. They are mammals breathing and yet living in the sea. They've got sonar. We can't even replicate a pico of what they can do. Submarines pale away into insignificance mm -hmm. compared with this fella. Nobody would say that a submarine could give you a chance. <coughs> Big Bang, undesigned. It's nuts. No way could that thing get here by chance. So God is on the throne. That's my argument. And I mentioned earlier that those solar panels on the space station are pathetic compared with what God has built in 
to the leaves on the trees in terms of their capacity to harness solar radiation, mm -hmm. turn it into energy and food for the growth of those plants. I came across this, which shows the chloroplast cells in a plant, and yet they're like little battery, fa little factories of batteries in the leaves of the plants. We can't see that, but they're like hundreds of little batteries in each cell in the leaf. Now you've got a cell phone and you have a little battery in it. You have a, uh, other gizmos that have batteries in them, but the batteries in these living organisms are way smaller, more sophisticated, and they're living. And then I came across this. We understand on a chemical level how photosynthesis works. Listen to the language. This is a secular science site. We can re-evolve, no, recreate the process in a laboratory, but we are not as good at it as plants are. They'll never acknowledge they're not as good as God does it. Did a plant ever go to do a, a, a doctorate or a master's in technology? No. I mean, where did that sophisticated capacity to harness the solar energy and let alone process it into energy and, 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 and food? To, to grow a plant come from. It's crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. What about this interesting character? Mm -hmm. You know, we're into the, the, the age of artificial intelligence and androids. Nobody would believe that Sophia, which is one of the most sophisticated publicly revealed androids, I think there's probably far more sophisticated ones, but this is an android, it's no joke. It's actually a highly intelligent um, android. You can ask her questions and she can give you answers and all sorts. Notice how she's giving this guy an apple. Does that remind you of anything in the biblical narrative? Mm -hmm. Anyone ever? Oh, I think she can't even hold an apple right. Yeah. <laughs> but this guy was one of the principal chaps behind the creation of Sophia. Nobody would believe that Sophia got there by a big bang over billions of years by blind brainless chance. Nobody. There is the designer. Mm. There is the creator of this thing. Yeah. Well, who made him? Yeah. Which is harder? This dude or him? Who made the dude? Come on, let's get real. So be empowered that with this idea of God on the throne, it's, it's not to be ridiculed, it's not to be taken lightly. It is defensible, it is rational, and we've got to engage people with that because they are hoodwinked, they are, they are brainwashed with secular, through secular education mm -hmm. to believe that everything just got here by nothing, brainless. So how does it all link into this theme of God on the throne? Well, if God is on the throne, then it has implications for us in terms of our response to him, our awe of him, our love towards him, um, our respect towards him. I think it's huge. But before I finish, I just want to build us up in an understanding that there's not just like one heaven. The scriptures talk about at least three heavens. So when the scriptures say God is on the throne and heaven is his throne, you've got to think, whereabouts might that be? Maybe that's why we don't see the throne quite as the scriptures refer. Because often people are thinking perhaps heaven is the <coughs> atmosphere where the clouds and the um, you know the birds fly. That's 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 the first heaven where the birds fly, where the clouds are. The second heaven in scripture is where the, the moon and the sun 
and the planets are, and the, the stars, you know, at night. That's the, like the second mm -hmm. heaven. But the Bible talks about a heaven of heavens. And in the New Testament, it refers to the third heaven. Let's check it out. Second Corinthians, please. Chapter 12. I've got three minutes left, Alistair, so get cracking. Second Corinthians. Do you want to read out? I'd love someone to read verses 1 to 4. Please. May I? Yes. Um, to boast, indeed, is useless for me. For I shall go on to visions and revelations of Yehovah. I know a man in Mashiach who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know. Elohim knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. Elohim knows that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not right for a man to speak. Thanks, Rich. So, I've got a hunch that when the Bible talks about heaven is his throne, I think it can be interpreted as, you know, referring to the vast expanse of the universe. But I also think God has a literal throne in a literal heaven of heavens a realm that we haven't yet a pico of an idea of other than what's revealed in scripture but Paul was caught up to this heaven of heavens and he saw things and I think um, John when he was caught up in the spirit and, and he wrote the things that are in the, the book of Revelation he said I saw a throne and him who sat upon it you know and, and it's like there's a realm out there that we have where we to look forward to, we haven't yet seen, but it's there. And not to be put off by the fact that we can't see it like the Hubble telescope. So I find that really exciting. And uh... Me too. <laughs> That's yeah. great. Mm. Yeah. That's really awesome. And uh, with the last 60 seconds, even though God is, is kind of out there on the throne, it doesn't mean to say he can't be present in our lives and with us in this room here today by his spirit. That's the exciting thing with God on the throne. He is able to be with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just going to fast forward straight to here. <clears throat> Jeremiah says, Am I a God at hand, says the Lord? Yes. And not a God afar off? Yes, he is a God afar off, but he's also a God at hand. Can any hide himself in the secret places that I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth? It's like, when we go from here, we think of God on the throne. Don't think that he's so far away that he can't be spoken to through prayer that he can't be worshipped and he can't be with you in your time of need and, and he can and I mentioned that the earth is in this crazy three dimensional motion they now realise that the planets are not just orbiting the sun but they're hurtling through space so I just want to very briefly tell you this the earth moves around its axis at 1,600 kilometers per hour, okay? When was the last time you got on the motorway and did 1,600 k's, Jeremy? It's really fast. That's the rotation around the axis. Yeah. But it's in an elliptical orbit around the sun, going around the sun at 107,000 kilometers per hour. So it's doing that, but it's hurtling at 107,000 kilometers per hour, but they've now realized that the whole shebang is hurtling through the Milky Way galaxy at 828,000 kilometers per hour. It's mm -hmm. like this crazy thing. Yeah. 
Imagine balancing that out. Imagine balancing that out. Yeah. And imagine trying to stay on a throne. If heaven is your throne, earth is your footstool, <laughs> how does God <laughs> manage to keep up? That I was can't my feel it. I can't feel it, though. That we're moving so fast. Yeah, I don't get it. <laughs> well, the point is that even though that's the reality, I want you to take away this idea that God's throne, His presence and authority, are more than able to be in place. That verse, Jer Jeremiah 21, 23, I cannot. Tw 23, 23, 23. 23. 23. Oh, 23, 23. Oh, okay. Gotcha. 